It's the only wrestling podcast on earth. And normally I would have this great statement where we have a four-time Stanley Cup champion, some all-star winners. We have a guy that's played all around the world and maybe won some record awards, a two-time X Division champion. All that doesn't matter because right now my favorite wrestler, who I've been excited about to have on the podcast. Guys, I'm sorry to just kind of make this intro short about you, but Matt Taven is on. And I am a Matt Taven Slappy, and Matt, thank you <laughs> so much. You are now the most important person on this podcast. I mean, I, I can't believe that was the intro. I was just saying before we got on, I am by far the least important person in this gallery view that I'm looking at. I am uh, honored to chat with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. That's why I corrected you, Matt, and I will keep the truth going here. I'm also, you'll know, the storyline guy, but that's why we have Dennis. And we're all big fans of what you do and what you've done. So thanks for joining us. Oh, my God. That, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So I've been trying to get you on for a while. And with COVID and your taping schedule, it hasn't worked out. And here you are finally. And I, I want to lead off the questions because I've had you on. And I've, even when it was just Petey and I and Petey couldn't make it, you and I have talked a few times on the on the podcast. And every time, and even now, I'm going to start the podcast off by saying, you are, by doubt, the most friendliest wrestler to your fans on any social media I've ever seen. And in this age, because we all kind of grew up in the age where you had the Scott Halls and, and all these other guys who like to kind of dump on their fans and on wrestling fans and call us marks and, and really dump. I, I don't know if I've ever really asked you this, but who taught you how to treat fans when you got to this level of wrestling? That's a great question. Um, you know what? A weird story that pops into my mind instantly. When we were in Japan uh, one time, I had, uh, it was me and Tama and a couple other guys were going out to eat. And we just kind of happened to be talking about Tama, about Haku. And, uh, you know, what that was like growing up with, with Haku as your dad and he, and uh, he would say you know they couldn't go anywhere without people kind of recognizing him and coming up and saying hi and that he always no matter what if they were in the middle of the of dinner would shake people's hands you know sign autographs take pictures whatever the case may be and when his wife would afterwards kind of say like hey we're eating or whatever he'd be like that's why we're eating because of these people right here and for me personally, you know, I, I was a heel uh, forever in Ring of Honor. And there was really this kind of groundswell that led me to, you know, ultimately the world title and, and the show at Madison Square Garden. But it was those people that were so loud on Twitter, you know, on the Internet, just kind of really getting behind me and what I was doing that if they didn't, if that never happened, none of the other stuff happens afterwards. So... I was always grateful for him, but especially now looking back at that time, I'm like the, the greatest moment of my life really happened because of the noise that these people were making uh, for me uh, on Twitter and Facebook and whatever else. So uh, I'll always be grateful for that. Well, Matt, you talk about, um, you know, how important the fans are and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I know you're at the, the ROH tapings right now. I'm at the impact tapings. It's, it's, it's great to see you, but uh, it really is. What, no fans. You know what I mean? I mean, we're in that same boat. There's no fans. And you know how important they are. Like, you know, what are your what are your broad thoughts on that right now? I mean, if in a perfect world, we, we would still have fans, you know, uh, it, there's absolutely nothing like it. And, and while I think, you know, Impact and Ring of Honor kind of in the same mold of their presentation right now, especially not having, you know, any fans at all by ringside, um, I think we're making the most of it. And, you know, you have to kind of change your style. Obviously you're wrestling more for the, the guy holding a camera right by ringside than the whole arena that's surrounding you. But it's without a doubt, man, some of those times you hit the ground and you hear nothing and you're like, yep. this is a lot. <laughs> people are screaming. So uh, it's, it's, there's no doubt that uh, I miss having fans and, you know, it looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel recently. And uh, hopefully we can start having shows in front of fans uh, sooner than later. Well, I was going to, you know, I mean, oh, go ahead, DMAC, go ahead. I was going to ask to the point that now, like you're in the middle of your career. You're not a new guy. You're you're more of entering season veteranship. Looking back, 
uh, or even till now, uh, what is one thing that you still love about the business and one thing that shocked you that that's a pain in the butt? And I, I remember because, and I say this because when it started to feel like a job or business to me, you know, fighting and stuff like that, there, there was that point with the love of the game. Now, I've gotten it back and, you know, wrestling's always been a part of that. But how about for you? Because because now you're setting the example and and being in the ring of honor all this time. It, it's definitely weird. I mean, when I got here, the locker room was full of guys like, you know, the Roger Strongs and the Kevin Steens. And, and to think that I'm one of the elder statesmen at this point in the ring of honor locker room, it's still I, I still don't think I'm OK with that notion. But um, I would say no matter what, the worst part about wrestling since from the beginning till this day is getting dressed and undressed. I will stand in my gear after uh -huh. a match and I just will look at it like uh, you got to start. Absolutely. We got to get out of here. And I'm usually like one of the last ones to leave the building because for some reason, peeling off spandex off your body and smelly knee pads is like my least favorite activity of all time. So I try to delay that as long as humanly possible. But um I think, I think for me, uh, something that makes me realize how much I still love wrestling is I, I get so excited right now when we, we have a chance to kind of watch everyone else and watch their matches and stuff. And I'm jumping on my seat. And when the guys come through, you know, you're clapping for certain guys and then you get upset for other things. And, and sometimes you're like, why am I so upset right now? And it's because I, I hate thinking of, going out there and kind of disrespecting wrestling, something that I've loved since I was six years old. So I, I think as long as that happens, like I, I feel like I'm my own worst critic all the time. And when I watch my own matches, I'm like, everything you do sucks. You're the absolute worst. And, and so like, I think as long as that's still in me to kind of drive me to go forward, I, you know, you say you're in you're the middle of my career. I, whew, my body feels differently. It feels like it's, it's been a long, long time, but I, I definitely still want to, you know, have a maybe another decade uh, to go. But uh, in the meantime, the fact that I'm still still so passionate about every little thing that I do, uh, one misstep, one slight miswording, and uh, it keeps me up at night. So it's like as long as that's still going, I know I still have the same love for wrestling that I always did. Well, my question's a little bit along the lines of DMAC because. You know, you, you, you came into ROH, you know, you, you got the TV title. You had a great match with Adam Cole and, and Hardy. Um, that's one, of, I think, one of the first times I ever sort of, you know, saw. But you've been in the ring with, like, Frank Kazarian, Daniels, Gallows, and New Japan, and Anderson. You've done the tag team thing, the kingdom, you know what I mean? Ultimo Guerrero, right? So it's yeah. like you've been in the ring with a lot of these, you know, now – sort of they're they're like the elder statesman right and you were a younger guy was there anybody not maybe meant that i mentioned or i didn't mention where you learned a lot from if so who who, who were those people i mean there's there's no doubt that uh, i wasn't ready to be in the ring with these two and i learned so much kind of on the job training uh, eddie edwards uh a guy that is still to this day one of my favorite wrestlers but man he's we're both from the boston area and he got in the ring with me for the first time when i was very very green very very new and i remember coming back through the curtain thinking i had the greatest match of my life and eddie was like oof <laughs> guess we'll get him next time and i was like what? <laughs> i don't know if i could ever do it better than that so uh you know i i, I definitely learned a lot from him and roger strong uh the two guys that when I was first into Ring of Honor, man, I was very intimidated to, to get in the ring with those two. And uh, just to see how they could guide and lead other people, you know, people that maybe shouldn't have been in the ring with them at the time was like, oh, I, I'm not good at all. Until I can do something like this, like I, I have a long way to go. So they always open my eyes. But without a doubt, the, there's, there's uh, as a tag team, and as a singles guy, there's there's two different people that that bring me uh, kind of the best out of me. Jay Lethal, me and him have chemistry that uh, I wish I could wrestle him every single night. And my favorite match of all time is with him. And as a team, anytime me and Mike have wrestled the Briscoes, 
it's kind of the only times in my life where I really feel like, oh man, I could kick some ass right now. Because if you don't, Jay Briscoe will kick your ass and uh, you, you have to fight for everything you got in there. Uh, so I definitely, anytime we stepped in the ring with the Briscoes, it brought another level out of me. And anytime I was in the ring with Jay Lethal, I, I definitely walked out much better than I walked in. But you know what? My question may feel like one of those wrestling gotcha questions built on getting headlines, but this is a real genuine Uh-oh. question here. Uh-oh. Uh, you, when you were kind of in the youth of the Ring of Honor, you built <laughs> around all this talent, and Ring of Honor was you know, right there at the top. Ring of Honor's gone through some rebuilding phases, and as it's done this, you've slowly climbed the ladder to be one of the locker room leaders and one of the, the, the faces of the company. How hard is it to transition from from here to down here and then to build the company back up here? Because we don't really hear about, you know, the guys. We hear about the guys up here and we hear about the guys up here, but we don't hear about the guys that are helping build the company back up in between the transitions. You know, well, I could be honest with you, it's a nightmare. But I mean, in reality, it's, it's what it's it's what happens you know every business is very, very cyclical and and uh we knew especially going into 2019 what we were getting into as far as that we, we were probably going to have to rebuild we never had a time as much as people have come and gone in ring of honor we've never had a time where seven plus guys almost 10 guys leave in a, in, at the end of one night and uh we definitely knew looking forward that there was going to be a drastic change. And as we led into Madison square garden, we, we could see what the future was going to be like, but I, I kind of found that as a sense of pride is like, yeah, I know that this is going to be some tough times, but I am 110% willing to put this company on my back or represent it in any way possible, because I believe in this company, I've seen it have its ups and downs and always come back up. And now we're at this position where, if you continue to do things that we're doing here, producing as good quality product as we're doing here, it eventually will catch fire. You know what I mean? It's, it's never at the, the time when it begins that people just jump on. It's once that, that snowball starts rolling downhill and growing. And uh, we definitely did that with the Pure Tournament coming back from, from the pandemic. And no offense, PD, but I, I would put our product against any other product and say it's the best one out there. Uh, since the pandemic, because these guys are hungry in this locker room. We know what, what's going on. We live in reality. We know that uh, Ring of Honor is an, as hot as it was in 2018, and that, that goes up our ass sideways. And we want to show everyone exactly why we are the best wrestlers and the best wrestling on the planet. We truly believe that from the top to the bottom around here. And uh, if, if anyone's curious on why we're so confident about that, they just need to tune in. You made Petey leave. And he had to go. I did. I, I said that, uh-huh. and now he's out. <laughs> I like it. But I, this is what I love about it, right? You got your – what I'm hearing is is what you want, and that's the companies pushing each other in a productive way because it's us fans who are benefiting. And Ring of Honor, I'll be honest, is the like sort of the last one. I went to New Japan – before that because of these guys audition but i'm really into it because of what you do and what's different i want to bring up that uh the anniversary coming up and your match against vincent because it's coming up on march 26 which is the 24 year anniversary of me pummeling the shit out of claude lemieux in the revenge game for the wings and that <laughs> special day and i'm the storyline guy so I know this goes way, way, way back because I did my homework and he's cost like, dude, he hit you with the freaking ax and then he licked his fingers pre COVID obviously, but <laughs> you know, like just goofy, like this is a history match. And on this day, I have good vibes for you, my brother to get, to get your revenge. But can you speak a little bit about what you guys have been building and how this has come sort of full circle where you have history. And I, I love that about wrestling. And I think that that's what ring of honor when you dig into it. And that's what Dennis, that's what Lars, that's what these guys have taught me more into the love I'm finding it. And that's, you know, what led me into you and the loyalty you talk about. So what, what do you got? You got to like, dude, I know about revenge. So I wish you sweet revenge. Can you tell me a little bit of something? What is you got planned for him? 
Well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, and it goes back to, to where you started there with the ax, you know, he, we were in a group together for three and a half years. All of a sudden I get cut with an ax. I have a giant scar on my forehead still to this day. He did drink my blood on television, which is always a weird sight to see. Uh, but you know, I really, I challenge anyone to as look at the last. Like, yeah. <laughs> as Lars is like, no, wait, I, what? I, I mean, I'm not show. people drink blood on TV. I mean, I, I'm okay with that. I'm sorry to interrupt. But I, was, I mean, obviously, uh, we, we were fine with it here at Ring of Honor as well. But uh, it, it's just, I think in the last year and a half, I mean, that, that started in November, November 1st, 2019. And we are now in March of 2021. And this thing has gone on this entire time. And it's one of those things that I, I definitely have a sense of pride in. If like, go, uh, go, who, who else has kept something going during a pandemic, uh, a five month ab absence for Ring of Honor. And we, and this thing has kept going this entire time. Uh, for, for Vinny and I though, this thing goes back a lot further than that. You know, we've known each other really since the very beginning, we trained at the building that this will take place at, uh, in Fall River, Massachusetts. We trained under Spike Dudley. Uh, we knew each other. I mean, I can really tell you that my first days in wrestling, I met Vinny and that's not just, you know, a storyline thing that's as real as it gets. And for the last 12 years, you know, our lives have been inter intertangled in, in crazy amount of ways. And even when we were in a group together, you know, he's the tag partners and you kind of find the, the absolute worst quality of him, you know, really bugs you, you know, like this guy's always late or this guy's doing this. And uh, it, it's weird because it's all those little animosities that really kind of grow. And then you have the opportunity to punch him in the mouth for all the things that he's pissed you off about for the last 12 years. And you take full advantage of that. So um, I plan on taking advantage of that even more on March 26th because I haven't even laid into him for, for stuff that has happened years and years ago. I, I've just scratched the surface of how pissed off I am at him for, uh, you know, not getting the rental cars until like the day of. And then all of a sudden I'm scrambling it to do it uh, for getting his passport when we're trying to cr cross the border. You know, all the things that I had to be his dad for for years because this idiot, uh, he can't even I, I'm, I'm shocked that he's been able to function through life. But those things have built up so much that I am so pumped to kick this guy in the teeth as hard as humanly possible. And um, I plan on doing that in the building where it all started on March 26th. Well, I, I have a two part question. Um, and it kind of goes back to something that you were, uh, Dennis was asking you about the rebuilding, the re you know, kind of the, the coming up of, our, uh, of Ring of Honor. Um, in 2011, I was at, uh, in Georgia when you got the Ring of Honor did that show uh, where the WCW Saturday Night was. Yeah. Um, what was the name of that place? Why I'm I'm losing so many pro the wrestling Omni, points. Uh, at it wasn't the Omni. It was not the Omni. Center the stage. Center, at center stage. Center stage. Okay. So, and in the back, because I was in the back, you have, you know, you had the Bucks, you had Cesar, you had most of these guys that were there are now in up north or. They're in AEW or other places. And at the time, that's kind of like the, the big, that was kind of like, because they would always run the show the same time as media, right? So mm -hmm. now, you know, here you are with this incarnation of Ring of Honor and you're doing Madison Square Garden. So I guess that question, that first part of the, the, my two questions is, do you feel like that era of Ring of Honor what uh, what is different from that era of Ring of Honor to where it is now? What's going to keep you there? You know, uh, uh, funny. I don't think that there's too much of a difference from that time, and and really all the locker room since. There was always this sense of a friendly competition in the Ring of Honor locker rooms. Like we we were always kind of built on like the best of the indies. It would come to Ring of Honor, and you always saw these guys all over the place, and and there would be this little like, oh, that guy got booked on that show, and I'm I'm I would that was supposed to be my spot, and there would always be this kind of friendly competition to kind of outdo the other matches that came before you, and I think if anything, that mentality has grown exponentially uh, in Ring of Honor, and since 2011. It, 
the competition and the talent in this locker room has continued to grow. And it's funny because now you look all over the place and all those guys were ring of honor guys. And to me, I always look at that as a plus because I was a lunatic wrestling fan that when I found out about this guy or that guy, I would look up everything they did before and it would, it would make me discover other things. It's how I discovered ECW. Uh, so to me, I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, there's a wrestling fan out there that's going to look up Adam Cole and see our matches at Ring of Honor and that, that will bring a new eyes to, uh, to Ring of Honor. Um, so I, I definitely think that in 2011, there was this mentality of, of being the, the best of on the card. And in 2021, it is so much more uh, of a mindset that everyone has, because again, we're looking to prove to people that um, no matter what has happened o- over the pandemic or over the year before, that Ring of Honor is still the best wrestling on the planet. And I think you could say that in 2011, and you could say that 10 years later. All right. Well, the second part of my question is, is that you had your injury. It was, I believe it was your knee, right? Was it your knee? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I've had two, two, three surgeries on my left knee and one on my ankle. Okay. There was one, there was a point where you're out for about a year. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, my knee. Okay. So you have that injury. How does your style change? Do you, or does it change at all? Or do you, you know, is, are you spooked to get back in afterwards? Like, tell me about what's going on there. Like, if you can, uh, you can go back. I mean, it, it, it's funny because my style should have changed a lot more. And maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment and, and have this weird, um, immortal mindset that I'm like, my knees will hold up if I just keep destroying them, no matter how many surgeries I have. Uh, so I probably should have changed up my, my game a tiny bit more. But I can definitely tell you that I used to springboard to the top rope. Those days are done. Um, you know, like uh, there's little things that I can see as a big change, but man, I went, um, I blew up my ACL. I also had a ruptured meniscus that they had a fish out of my hamstring. I had a, another torn meniscus that they had to repair. And the first doctor, I had an MCL tear as well. The first doctor I saw, uh, I don't think he was too familiar with sports guys, but he was like, it's going to be two and a half years before you wrestle again. I haven't seen anything this bad. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go somewhere else. And uh, once I finally got hooked up with a doctor who I think had, had been around more athletes, he's like, we can get you back in probably a year. Well, about six months, seven months in, I'm approached by, by Ring of Honor and CMLL uh, about wanting to have my return be in Arena Mexico. And like I said, I, I've been a, a lunatic wrestling fan since I was a kid, and uh, I love the stories of guys who have gone all around the world and have picked up all these little things in all these different areas. And it, it makes you this complete wrestler. And yeah, so to me, real, I'm like, real quick though, but like you're come, you come back to that and look who you step in the ring with. I mean, that's got to just make you shit your pants a little bit. Right. I mean, come on, the, the whole the dirt. Thing. come on, give me the, the dirt. Whole thing was absolutely insane. I'm saying like, I haven't been, I all of a sudden tell my doctor, like, hey, I got to be in Arena Mexico. I'm not missing this. And he's like, I don't, I, that's kind of crazy. So eight and a half months, I said, I'm doing it. He, if we put it into overdrive a little bit, but he was not, I don't think he was 100% about me going down there. And then I go down there and I'm in the ring with Roosh, Ultimo Guerrero, Ultimo Guerrero, who I'm a huge, huge fan of. And like one of my favorite matches of all time was with Ultimo Guerrero in Arena Mexico. And I was not prepared for them to start throwing, you know, money in the ring and they throw coins and those son of a, those things hit you so hard. <laughs> I think I got a black guy from a coins getting thrown in the ring then <laughs> from the match, but like oh, so many crazy things happen. It's the first time I'm wrestling with this giant knee brace and you have to walk down these huge, crazy stairs in arena Mexico. And as I'm walking down the top strap of this ACL brace, just boosh, just blows open. <laughs> and I'm trying to like makeshift tie it in the corner. I, and, but for some strange reason, I was like, I'm not changing anything. I'm doing the dives to the outside. I'm doing all this. I'm in Arena Mexico. And I, I'll still say to this day, Arena Mexico is the best place to wrestle in. The fans are so crazy there that no matter if you could barely walk, you'll pull off whatever craziness you had in mind because they will make your adrenaline go through the absolute roof. Mm-hmm. So I, I owe everything to go into Mexico. I went down there and it totally changed my mindset on things. I came back a different star and, and a different confidence. And, and again, Madison Square Garden doesn't happen without going to Mexico. Uh, 
Um, and, and wrestling guys like, like Ultimo Guerrero, like Volador Jr., Roosh, Dragon Lee. And it's funny because now you're seeing them in Ring of Honor so much. At that time, you know, you, you, they weren't breaking into America as much as they are now. And I was going down there really not knowing what I was fully getting into. And it's, it's almost like wrestling the Briscoes. You know you're in a fight with a lot of those Mexican guys. And you got to step it up and bring it or, or they'll swallow you whole. I I'll, I gotta jump in because ever you know with this whole forbidden door thing, and I want to come with this question from a different angle. Of right now, Ring of Honor is kind of the last to to get involved in this, and I think from as a fan point of view, it's smart for Ring of Honor because it makes people clamor and want it even more. As a as a talent, not speaking for Ring of Honor, but as a talent, do you sit back and go, you know what? I don't want to be involved in this. Let them do that thing. We sit back. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to build it. And people will come to us because they want to see us involved in this. Uh, well, I guess it's twofold. My answer is, is I think we were the first one to do this because, I mean, you saw New Japan, CMLL, NWA. You saw everyone come to Ring of Honor. And we really opened that door for those promotions to kind of come into the United States in the first place. So to me... That started with us. But as far as right now, um, I would say that, you know, like I said earlier, I feel like there's such a good product. And once people, no matter what, if they jump in right now, they're going to get caught in that snowball. And for, for my mindset, we don't really, th this roster up and down, I would, I would grab them any day of the week and, and put them out there and be absolutely proud of the product because I think that, as much as the, you know, it, it's interesting to bring people in here to have cross promotional stuff. We have so much talent right here in these doors that we could put on the best product there is out there with just the guys we have in Ring of Honor. And uh, I, I will I will die on that hill any day. You don't have to because I, I actually agree <laughs> with you on that whole because uh, Ring of Honor from top to bottom. And you take out the major companies who have the ton of money to spend. The New York Yankees of wrestling. They they don't really count in this argument. I, I and we talk about this all the time in the product as much as we're impact slappies with PD. I, I feel like from top to bottom, the Ring of Honor roster is more put together than an impact. Thank you. I I agree a hundred percent. You know, I, I still feel like I said that mentality of competitiveness, but now we have international stars like i was saying like roosh and dragon lee coming in you know hopefully sooner than later later guys like mark haskins and joe henry uh Slex from australia you know we still have guys like pco coming from canada it is it is such a, a amalgamation of of guys that all come from different walks of life but all have the same mindset and uh, Man, there's sometimes I'll watch a Ring of Honor match and I'll be like, I, I don't think I know how to wrestle after watching that. I think that that's, that was so good that I, I question everything that I can do. So as long as that is still happening um, and I'm not watching it going, what the hell is going on out there? I think that uh, we're in pretty good shape. Are you at me? Or are you going to take three in a row, Dennis? I'm sorry. <laughs> you can, I, I, I'm not passing. All sucker. <laughs> Shit, I'll, I'll I'll get straight to it. Uh, you mentioned Spike Dudley and ECW. What's the one thing that you learned? Because I love Spike Dudley, but you learned about wrestling that you use to this day. Uh, everything. Uh, like it's it's funny because I always talk about like training with Spike Dudley as like walking in that day. I I knew nothing about independent wrestling training or anything. I just knew I loved wrestling and I wanted to be one since I was a child. And so when someone first said like, hey, Spike Dudley has a school, I think you should go to it. I was like, Spike Dudley? Like, I didn't know if I was walking in and I was going to get thrown through a table and, and do crazy stuff. And that was all we were going to learn is ECW type stuff. And then I walked in and was like, oh, my God, Spike Dudley's the smartest person I've ever met in my life. He knows everything about wrestling and realized that to make money in this business, he had to find his niche and make the most of it. You know, he's, he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's, you know, he's not the strongest guy in the world, but he's had one of the most impressive careers going through all the major companies, winning gold all over the place and obviously making money doing it. And to see a guy at that stature be so successful, you know, there's something up here that, that obviously has led him in that direction. But then 
he would show us things in the ring. I was like, you've never done anything like this on TV. Like why, why, why have you been holding this, you know, as a secret? He's like, cause that's not what Spike Dudley would do. And I'm like, Oh my God, you're just, you know, too much. You're blowing my mind. But uh, I still always say like, there's a match in ECW Spike Dudley versus Rob Van Dam that I pre- I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube. But Spike Dudley is more Rod Van, Rob Van Dam in that match than RVD is. Like, he's doing all this crazy stuff. He's doing Lucha stuff. And you're like, I think Spike was just feeling it that night. But he's uh, he's got this abundance of knowledge. And I literally owe everything to him. Well, obviously, because both you and fucking DMAC decided to show up in your goddamn tie-dye. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro. Hey, what shirt are you wearing, Lars? Well, I'm wearing a school of Morton. My good buddy, Mr. Ricky Morton, sent me this shirt. I just have yeah. to have you all know from a, from a little tag team called the Rock and Roll Express. Have you guys heard of them? No. But um, uh, I, I was about to say, Dennis, I mean, you didn't notice from the haircut on the skull what that <laughs> shirt was. I mean, that's the most infamous hair of all time. <laughs> well, you know, Ricky Morton is, is such a good dude. And uh, thanks, right. Ricky, for sending me the T-shirt and the care package. Um, you know... One of the things that I think watching ROH from the very get-go, and like you was talking about, it was, it was always like a place where the, 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 the cream of the crop of the independent wrestlers would always go. And I think that's what made that company so special. And then you talk about, you know, all the other companies coming in and exposing Americans to, um, you know, international talent and stuff like that. And if you weren't a tape trader like myself, there, that might have been your first glimpse, right? So, at, at, when when you're when you're doing that kind of thing, what's more important to you? Is it that is it the big picture of getting ROH over, or is it like putting these guys over, or what what is it that you're trying to accomplish when in your in your perspective when you're bringing in international talent from different promote promotions? Because obviously, you know, if you go to Mexico. You know, they're, they're, they're doing a, a, a match in Spanish, you know, I've, you know yeah. or whatever it is. So it's like, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish with that other than just the star power? Uh, I think it's really broadening the audience. You know, we live in such a world right now where no matter where you live, your, your phone can, can tell you, show you any video from any wrestling promotion. The, the days of trade tating is a uh, trade. Wow. Tape trading. <laughs> Uh, it's a tough one to say. Yeah, they're dead, unfortunately, as fun as they were, because right now you can just go on your phone and I could see what's happening in Japan and Mexico in a second. So without a doubt, like bringing those guys into Ring of Honor is is showing Ring of Honor to a national, an international audience and really kind of growing that fan base because it was for so long the creme de la creme of the indies in America. And now, you know, it's it's all the top stars from all over the world. Uh, At the same time, you know, guys like Roosh, I don't know if people know how big of a star he is in Mexico. You know, like he is a he's he's the top guy in Mexico. And so when he comes up here, he's bringing a giant audience with him. Um, But at the same time, he's such a big star in Mexico. And the fact that people don't really know him up here as much, it's doing wonders for him as well to get that exposure. Um, but I, I think everyone in the locker room, whether they're international or not, and right now I feel I, I've made this point a couple of times, but I, I definitely think that everyone feels like if, if I get over, if Matt Taven, you know, it, it starts blowing up and, and more and more people start following me, well, that's going to help Ring of Honor. And I think we all have that that mentality of like, we need to be bigger stars and, and Ring of Honor will, will come along with us. You know, it's funny you say that because... When Petey retired from wrestling and doing the podcast the first time, before I got had, it was me and Eli Drake, I approached you to do a podcast, and you were doing one already of your own, which bummed yeah. me out because, like I said, you're my favorite wrestler. But I, I felt like the podcast industry in the wrestling helped bring the whole indie scene back up because now you have fans become content providers. You have wrestlers become content providers on a different level. What... I guess what made you get into doing podcasting? Did it change the way you looked at the industry when you started doing podcasts? Uh, You know, it's, we live in like, especially with all the streaming services and stuff, like no matter what you like, whether, no matter how niche it is, you can get a straight pipeline to that. 
that. So like a lot of it was to grow a fan base, but also to, to give my fans uh, a, a, a access to me. But uh, at, at the same time, there's, there's a big part of me that knows that I cannot fall down forever. You know, it, there is going to be one day where I cannot do it anymore. And I still have always loved being in the entertainment business in one way or the other. I would love to get into broadcasting. I always love talking about sports. So it was kind of a, a big good way for me to kind of step into that industry and really kind of see what it was like to see how my voice sound if I ever wanted to pitch that to, to places. And um, I think that you can you can literally cut right now go on your phone and find exactly what you're looking for whether it's a podcast or a streaming service and that, that's a like a, a very cool thing at the same time it divides an audience a lot it kind of makes your attention go into a lot of different places so I felt like hey I got to jump in this pool and have my voice be heard at the same time you know what I mean I don't, I don't want so many people going to all these different places I'm kind of getting lost in the shuffle so I definitely wanted to jump in and feel how it was and, and I wish Petey stayed on because I have been waiting to ask him <laughs> does he realize the influence that he has had on the wrestling world and how everyone does Canadian destroyers now and like why he didn't name it the Petey driver or something so every time someone set, does it they have to be like that's Petey Williams <laughs> oh, that is before you do as, as Petey's best friend sitting in his house let me just say this I've had the pleasure of watching matches with Petey, and I've learned um, that everybody does it, but not everybody does it well. And uh, he he actually ranks them and, and stuff because, you know, whatever the thing, like MJF brought up the fact that he stole it from Red or something like this. But he but the thing is, he polished it to make it his own. I, I believe you're right. But Dennis, do you have more to that story? But it is. They're all over. Now it's like the it's a niche and I think it's one of the greatest moves ever. And then Adam Cole stole it and changed it to the Panama dream sweeper or whatever. I was <laughs> like, here, whatever, like this, Dennis, what do you got on that? Here, we'll go to the reporter in the room. Big J journalism over there, Dennis. You, you know what? I think PD understands the move in the, impact it's had on the business but him as a wrestler i don't think he values himself as high as everybody does he still freaks out when people are like dude i'm a big fan of yours i loved watching you as a kid i mean how many times have we had a wrestler on or even you lars even you d mac when you guys came on as guests and you guys pd williams he's like what are you guys geeking out over me for i, I i'm a nobody and, and he truly feels that way. Now, he understands his move, but he, I think he feels like his move is different from him and his own legacy. I, I mean, I think he's a great Canadian because he named the move he's unselfishly after the country. And, you know, if it was me, it would have been the, the Matt Taven driver. And if anyone stole it, I would have <laughs> is the Matt Taven driver. But, really uh, you know, I, to me, personally, I always say this, like, there, there are – three guys total that I don't think get the due or the, the credit that they deserve for how they shape the business and how it is right now. PD Williams, without a doubt, you watch his move every night of the week on whatever channel you're watching. And the Motor City Machine Guns changed the way that we do tag wrestling. And obviously then the Bucks did it too. And it kind of went along the line, but like PD and the, and the guns and that TNA era, you know, with Jay Lethal and Sanjay and all these guys who like really, really changed th the way we do wrestling now. Uh, they don't get uh, they don't they get this much credit when they th they've done so much. But yeah, I mean, you should get credit, too, because you're you're one of the new leaders here in this this new era of Ring of Honor. You're you're humble. You're amazing to the fans. I I can't believe how many times, because I have, you're one of the few people I have said on my phone when you tweet, I get an alert from. So, and it's a lot of, oh man, thank you so much. And I believe it was even last year that someone had tweeted you, and I'm going to, I'm humble bragging for you. So just sit back and enjoy this ride here. Uh, someone was just, you know, tweeted you like, oh, Matt, you're my favorite wrestler. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could have, I wish. What? There's only to see you. Back? You okay? Oh, uh, there he goes. But um, you, you, someone tweeted at you and said, hey, uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm a big fan. I just lost my job. I wish I could buy a shirt. And you sent some shirts out to the guy. I mean, I don't see that in today's wrestling anymore. So right there, I mean, how do you not like you as a favorite wrestler? 
<laughs> oh, I mean, just ask the internet. There's plenty of re- they, there's plenty of people that hate my guts. I'm sure they'll give you a million reasons why. Uh, I feel like I haven't. I I've continued to just do other people's stuff. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm still kind of that fan that's wrestling like all my idols. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe my influence is the amount of purple that's in wrestling today. Maybe I. I started that trend, no pun intended. But uh, like I said, it's to me, I, I feel like um, I, I wouldn't be living this life. You know what I mean? I, I would have no no chance at all to live a life that I, I literally, as a six-year-old boy, looked at the TV and was like, that's what I want to do. I would have no opportunity of doing that if it wasn't for the, my fans, the Ring of Honor fans. So to me, just send a couple of T-shirts to a guy uh, down as luck is no big deal. Phenomenal. Uh, and that, guys, I got a couple of uh, Twitter questions. I know we got a few more minutes with you before you have to get off. And- well, I have one more big question, so maybe we can yeah, do it. Now. But I, I have a very a question that, that needs to get answered and not avoided. <laughs> I'm ready for it. All right. But go ahead. Go ahead, Dennis. Go ahead. Well, I'll let you guys ask yours. Then I'll oh, no, no, because this might be a little bit more involved. So just get, get All to right. it. Uh, I'll do one Twitter, then I'll go to DMAC. Uh, Debers wants to know, uh, do you have your schedule for day and time for WrestleCon? I do. I just got it today. Uh, I'll be there Friday and Saturday. Um, I believe I'm there in the I'm from 12 to like 4 on Friday. And I think I'm there from like 9 to 2 or, or 10 to 2 on Saturday. So early on Saturday, midday on Friday. Uh, hopefully, you know, it's, it's a crazy time, but hopefully we'll be able to finally see some fans for the first time in a long time at WrestleCon. DMAC? I just wanted to say that you did such a great job explaining about that Ring of Honor to anybody out there that's newer to it is the foundation and solidity of international wrestling. As uh, I'm watching Flamita right now, wrestle uh, you know like and just seeing because that's where i think you brought up a great point matt where it's about all of you guys building something but we're the next greatest people like you said roosh and different things they're big in other countries but you know and you see the pure wrestling see i, I watched ring honor to watch wrestling i watched the other shows to watch the storylines and the, and the and the comedy and all that different thing and you know somebody to spit spit off but the reality that you guys capture as a fan i want to say kudos and it's great to be so what how you because you get it and then the way it is even though dennis if you didn't spill anything he's just got his mouth down there so don't worry about it but i appreciate it i've been a big fan oh thank you man i mean i really have to say as far as the pure stuff jonathan gresham has been the mvp of ring of honor since we've returned from the pandemic he is absolutely unbelievable um, Brian Johnson is as, as annoying as he is on Twitter. That kid, as long as he keeps running his mouth is going to be a big star and Bandito. I j- jump on Bandito's bandwagon buy stock in Bandito right now, because he is going to be the biggest star one day. He's absolutely incredible. Uh, Lars, do you want me to go with another Twitter question real yeah, quick? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, uh, this one comes from Courtney, who is, once again, a massive fan of yours, as we all know. After your, She's got two questions here. After your unsanctioned match on the 19th anniversary, do you and Bennett plan on focusing on the tag team uh, title division? I'm, without a doubt. I mean, that's, that's the reason why Mike returned to Ring of Honor. Uh, unfortunately, that time that Lars brought up about me blowing out my knee was not only the craziest match, but the craziest day where... In one swoop, uh, I'm looking down the barrel of major reconstructive knee surgery and Mike Bennett signs with TNA. And all of a sudden, Mike and Maria, who, you know, we travel around the world with one another are gone. And it just wasn't the way I was ready to end that story or end that tag team. And uh, the fact that we finally get to do after years of talking about it, we finally get to do it without a doubt. Me and Mike want to do exactly what we did uh, in that two-year run together where we went all around the world winning all the golds we could. And, you know, we have our eyes set on all these different places. And, of course, it starts right here in Ring of Honor. Courtney also asked, and we had Gresham on last week, who we absolutely enjoyed talking to, 
and we've the talked about the uh, Ring of Honor Pure a few times here. She wants to know, seeing that the Pure title is the only title you haven't won yet, is that mm-hmm. something that's on your radar? And I guess I'm going to piggyback and ask, do you feel like you could be a Pure wrestler? Oh man, you're challenging my skills right now. I uh, I think I could be a pure wrestler. I, I I have to go back and I would have to you know definitely get back in the lab and adjust a few things. But there are without a doubt times where I watch Jonathan Gresham out there, Tracy Williams, Jay Lethal. When I watch their pure wrestling, and I'm like, ah, oh, maybe maybe I can't do it. You know what I mean? Like there's definitely times where I think, damn, these guys are so good. I don't know if I could win the pure title, but without a doubt. Um, I always need a new challenge and uh, to be the only guy to ever hold all the titles in ring of honor is definitely on that list at this point. So as much as, you know, it, it's down the line, I got a couple of things. I got to slap around Vincent, me and Bennett got to win the, the tag titles. I would love to have my rematch for the world title, but down the line, you know, getting in there and testing out my pure skills, hopefully, you know, not embarrassed by, by the octopus uh, is, is probably on the bucket list, but further in the future. Lars, last question is yours. Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to, I want to preface this with, um, you know, anything can happen in wrestling in a wrestler's career before I, before I uh, ask this question, but, you know, to harken back to what we were talking about, about ring of honor being that place where the King of the Indies would go. And then they would take that and uh, then go on to other, other places, greener pastures, so to speak. And I, you know, for the longest time, I think um, as a wrestling fan, I looked at, at Ring of Honor as like the, the, uh, the supporting act. You know, that's the worst place you want. You don't want to get typecasted when you're in a fucking band as the supporting act. You, you have to break out some point and be a headliner. And in the last couple of years, I feel like that's what Ring of Honor is sort of like becoming, right? And it's, and it's, it's flourishing. What for you is going to keep you there? What, what is it, what is it going to take for you guys to stay there is, and do you have any other aspirations? Other, I, you know, you talked about the commentating and whatever and the sports talk and all that. I get that. But do you have any other aspirations outside of that company? Would you, would you, do you have like this dream of getting to the, to the, to the North or, and I mean, you don't have to answer it because I, I will answer it. No problem. I got yeah. it. So uh, set the set the set the set set the record straight. Well, I would would be lying to you, and I would never lie to you uh, if I didn't say as a kid I thought I needed to go to the WWE and and you know wrestle at WrestleMania. But as my you know career has advanced, and as I've been able to do all these different things. That's not necessarily my mindset anymore. And um, maybe, you know, you don't know wrestling. Who knows if if it ever will happen? But without a doubt, I... I have signed a long-term deal with Ring of Honor. And so my mind is, is here for, for this foreseeable future. And But I think the more important question is, what is going to change Ring of Honor from necessarily being a stepping stone for some people to being the place? And that has, I think, already started to change. You know, you saw I resigned, the Briscoes resigned, Jay Lethal resigned, Roosh resigned. And like when, you know, from band experiences, when you get into, you know, you you have your favorite band and all of a sudden their lineup changes, you're like, I cannot support them anymore. I, this, this lineup sucks. And that's without a doubt true for wrestling fans as as well. Uh, So the fact that a lot of the guys are saying, no, this is our home. We're staying right here or EC3 choosing us over other places. It's, it's, we're building something right now. And it starts with keeping those guys that have been here for a long time and that people have been familiar with as well as integrating the new guys into that system and making that and keeping them for the long run too. So I think it's, it's already started. You know, you've seen these guys commit to ring of honor. Uh, There's been a slew of re-signings recently, but you know, guys that that especially since the pandemic, like a John Congresham, you know, re-signing with ring of honor and saying, no, we, we are sticking our flag in the ground. This is the place to be. This is the best wrestling in the world. Take it or leave it. Um, And, and at the same token, you know, as far as the greener, greener pastures place mindset, that is changing as, as, as well. You know, we, we have definitely 
have grown up since the times that I was sleeping on a, on a floor in the La Quinta, just hoping to get uh, someone to recognize me as I'm helping out doing Ring Crew. You know, we have grown as a company and we are definitely taking the steps to make sure that this isn't no longer a stepping stone. This is the place to be. And it's just a matter of time before uh, that, again, that snowball continues to roll downhill and we can continue to grow on it. You, you said something that's interesting there, but it's also true is and we've talked about impact a lot on the show and especially with PD and impact, I think, has got to a point where they're OK with being a stepping stone where they're almost like, all right, we'll be the minor leagues. We'll develop the young talent. They'll go make more money somewhere else, but that will bring more talent in and we'll develop them and we'll keep it going. And for a ring of honor who I feel like struggled at times to find an identity after those seven or 10 guys left the company, you did a really great job of not becoming another feeder company for some other big company. And it, it goes unnoticed a lot with wrestling fans that you guys have, have done that. Well, uh, just to back up real fast, I'm sorry to cut you off, but anybody who is anybody has stepped foot in a ring of honor ring. Whether so. Brian Danielson or what, what Daniel Bryan, American whatever, like and punk. I mean, add the lit, add infinitum. Like you, it's almost like you, that was the rite of passage to go through. Sorry to cut you off. I, I, no, I, I mean, but you, you're both are right because it was for a time, a rite of passage. Like you had to go and make yourself a ring of honor. Then you'd go elsewhere where I think we came back from the pandemic. And like you said, Dennis, we really kind of said, this is us. We we're taking this part of the market and we're making it ours. And if you want to jump on board, jump on board, but this is our identity and we're going to keep the people here that make that identity true. And we're going to grow on that. And, uh, Man, I, I really couldn't be prouder to be part of Ring of Honor. D Mac? Too is what you said, is everybody's in. You know yeah. what I mean? You got guys that are all in for the press. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're going to be successful. It's, it's, if you fall down the hill, go over the cliff, it doesn't matter. I love, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure. I love your loyalty and I love your heart. And I wish you all the best because that's the thing is that you guys decided that it's not the prehistoric place, ring of honor, get the dust off. No, we're giving you the new version because we know what the history means. And I, I love that about you guys know who you are. Definitely. You know, I, I try to be as, as well-versed as I can and, and reading a book like, like The Tipping Point, where you have to continue to make the right decisions and believe in the decisions you make and continue down that path and sooner or later, there will be the tipping point. And I think we truly, everyone here in Ring of Honor believes in what we're doing. Well, for everybody at home, the show's about to end. For us, we'll probably jib-jab a little bit off the air. But I didn't do it at the top of the show. I'll do it at the back end for the four-time Stanley Cup champion, Darren McCarty. From Petey Williams, the two-time Exhibition champion who popped off early. From two of our former Major League Baseball All-Stars who can't be here, Jason Kendall, Dimitri Young. To one of my favorite rock and roll, just punk legends and Lars, me, Dennis Farrell. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Wrestling Perspective here on Fight TV, which, by the way, comes on right after Ring of Honor on Monday nights on Fight. So, I mean, what better relationship here? So, thank you guys so much for watching. Matt Taven, thank you, man. You have made my year. Oh, stop. Thank you guys so, so much. It's an absolute honor to, to talk to you guys. Thank you guys for taking the time out to talk to me. Give the Briscoes a high five for me, please, because those dudes rule. I love those dudes. They're, they're the best humans on the planet. I know maybe that's ruining their, their, their shtick a little bit, but there's no one that there's no one I would want in a fight to back me up more and no one I would want to hang out and share a beer with more than those two. They are, they are the absolute best. So we'll do. Give them my love. Will do, man.